Hey everyone, welcome to the Acrobatic Arts Podcast. I'm Loren, and I will be interviewing some of the top leaders and innovators from the dance and acrobatic industry. If you are a teacher, performer, student, or a lifelong learner like myself, you are sure to find these episodes intriguing and full of inspiration. Acrobatic Arts is passionate about providing current and relevant information for everyone. So please, sit back and enjoy as we share our passion with you and the world. Today we have a fantastic guest who's about to unveil a groundbreaking platform that is set to revolutionize the world of dance media. Joseph Brown is here to tell us about the Library Aesthetic, a space where dancers, teachers, choreographers, and fans alike can seamlessly access a rich tapestry of dance content. Let's get started. Welcome to the podcast, Joseph Brown. Thank you so much, Lauren. We are thrilled to have you as our guest and can't wait to learn about the wonderful new online dance resource called The Library Aesthetic. Before we fully dive in, let's get to know Joseph Brown and the story behind The Library Aesthetic. What led you to embark on this dance-centric venture and how does it reflect your vision for the dance community and educators at large? That is such a massive question. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> um, look, I, I've spent my career, and Timothy Heathcote, who developed it, uh, we developed this together. And look, we've spent our careers in dance. Uh, we were all trained just like most dancers. We were trained from a very young age in dance. Uh, we both went on to have professional careers. My personal professional career took me down the path of classical ballet. I started off as a break dancer, actually. started break dancing. Then I sort of fell in love with drama, fell in love with a couple of girls <laughs> that wanted to that drag, drag me along to a dance class, to a Friday night jazz dance class. And then I sort of fell in love with... Um, I think I fell in love with being a part of that arts community, that sort of celebrated uniqueness. I always felt a little bit odd. I felt like I didn't quite fit in, didn't quite belong. And so it was really good to find a community that you sort of just felt like, yeah, uniqueness was celebrated and you could be creative within and find yourself within. I think I, I really needed that at that time in my life. I was sort of that early teens. And then I sort of fell in love with classical ballet very late, but I fell in love with classical ballet. And then I went down the classical ballet path, went to the Australian Ballet School, went to the Australian Ballet, um, became a soloist with the Australian Ballet. Then I got some serious injury, went over to Turkey and worked in a modern dance company in Turkey for a year. And then I came back and I ended up joining Sydney Dance Company. And I spent the next seven years with Sydney Dance Company. Um, during that time, I, I had another small injury and I took a sabbatical and went and did a musical for nine months. And then I fell in love with musical theatre, that singing, acting, dancing all together at a really high level. And then I ended up going into musical theatre and I spent the next seven years of my career in musical theatre. And that took me through to about the age of 42. And then I went into straight acting and did a, a um, what, uh, it's, a it's a soap in Australia called Neighbours. And did, and did a whole bunch of other smaller roles on other uh, TV shows and films. But then I was sort of drawn back to dance. And I was always teaching along this, along this line, mostly contemporary and classical. And then I got drawn in uh, through Tim, Timothy Heathcote to MDM Dancewear. And Tim asked me to come in. I was now sort of 45, 46. And he asked me to sort of come and join him at MDM Dancewear and sort of grow this into an international company and i don't know if you know much about mdm but the, the reason this is relevant is because mdm has a unique uh a unique sort of dance based support in all of the footwear which is a to help health the health of a dancer to help set up the physiological and technical development of a dancer and because of that we ended up having lots of lots of conversations with physiotherapists and podiatrists and that ended up taking us off to um an organization called iadams international association for dance medicine and science and we started going to the conferences there were little sort of i adams x events that happened in australia and sydney and melbourne but then in i think it was 2016 i went to my first international i adams event which was in houston in texas and after that we ended up going to i think Finland was the next one, Helsinki, Finland. And then we went to Montreal in Canada, which is where I also met uh, some of the acrobatic arts team uh, at that event. And then we did the, uh, the one in Limerick, Ireland. Being a part of that really sort of opened my eyes that there was this, all this amazing dance, health, 
conversations and research that were going on at this really sort of high level at these conferences and amongst physiotherapists and researchers. But we spend most of our time local ballet school. That's where we spend our time talking to teachers, um, talking to studio directors and principals, trying to communicate with dancers, trying to talk to them and educate them about our products. And immediately, and I don't know what the situation is in every part of the world, but Australia sort of punches above its weight in terms of dance. And we're known around the world, you know, in terms of our population to produce very good dancers. And yet, and that is true, we do. But I also realized that the vast majority of these conversations and great information that was happening at this level at the I Adams events was not getting down to the local ballet studio. And even though we've got the internet and social media and Instagram and, and all these uh, different things, most of that information is not feeding into the local dance studios. And there's like a lag that, and I started to think that this is like a generational lag or maybe even 10, 20, 30 year lag for this information to get down. And why is that? And so we kind of started to brainstorm and think, what can we do? What can we do to kind of get all of this great dance health information? And then we started obviously exploring other places like YouTube and Instagram and different syllabus around the world and realizing how much great information is out there, but it's all diversified it's diversified and dispersed across you know tiktok instagram facebook youtube separate websites individuals like your marie walton Mans or your lisa howells your zach jones sally harrison's dr nikki k it's all sort of diversified and we thought what if we could sort of bring this all together into one sort of unique streaming service platform like like a netflix or a Disney or a Stan. Now, obviously, we can't do it at that same level because um, we're just getting started and we're relatively small and these guys have millions and millions of dollars. But there, it is, there is the ability now. It's not probably within the realms of every individual, but it's become much more accessible with uh, the development of technology to be able to create a sort of a basic streaming service and sort of pull all this sort of stuff together. And so... That's, that was the inspiration behind the Library Aesthetic Dance Media. We just wanted to bring it all together and make sure that it was credible information as well. That's the other thing, because there's a lot of great information out there, but there's also a lot of not great information, as I think we all know. And yeah. it's like, and how, do you, how does a young dancer or even a young teacher, how do they know how to discern between what is credible and reliable information and what isn't. So one of the other really important features in creating the Library Aesthetic Dance Media was that um, it was reliable and that's why we reached out and that's why it was fundamentally important to reach out to organisations like Acrobatic Arts, like the Royal Academy of Dance, like iAdams, because we needed them to provide sort of a foundation and that credibility for the platform. Well, you know, I was actually at the I Adams conference in Montreal. I'm not sure if we talked personally, but I sort of had the same feeling that there's so much great information, but it's not being translated to the studio. And so I think what you're doing is wonderful. And I think there's a definite need for it. And I hope everyone understands that we're trying to connect the two worlds. And Acrobatic Arts is so excited to be a part of it because we do believe in safety. That's been our, our mission from day one. But what really got me is you said the library aesthetic has a Netflix style subscription model. And I think that's sort of like a dance enthusiast dream that you have to just go to one platform to get all your dance needs met. So that in itself is, is really cool. How do you think that approach will resonate with dance teachers and studio owners? Yeah, it's a really hard question to answer, Lauren, because the, 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 the truth of it is we don't know. No one's created a platform quite like this before. There's lots of really good platforms out there that do dance classes or dance coaching. Um, there's good platforms, individuals. There are many great individuals out there that have their own coaching or physiotherapy, nutrition, mind and wellness, strength and conditioning, technical training platforms, but not all together in one. And obviously we're hoping because there's a couple of reasons streaming services are fantastic, okay? And we and most of us know the obvious things that all of these streaming services are based on volume. They're hoping to get, a, they, they keep the price down nice and low, and then hopefully they get a lot of eyeballs. And we're, we're trying to emulate that, that model. 
But one of the great things about a streaming service that I love, and I think most of us do, is that you end up finding stuff that you never would have found. You find stuff that you didn't even know you were looking for. It gives you a sense of play, that you get on there and you just play and you explore. And sometimes that can be really frustrating. I'm sure most of us have sat there scrolling through for half an hour sometimes going, how can I not find anything to watch <laughs> when there are thousands of pieces of content on here? So that can also be a source of frustration sometimes. But because this is a niche streaming service, everything on here is related to dance. And there's inspiration, there's motivation, strength and conditioning, mind and wellness, nutrition, um, physiotherapy. We hope that people will just come to the site because they maybe they want something specific. They're looking for something. They've got a, a specific problem with one of their students or the student has a specific problem and that's why they come. But then they fall in love with learning as part of the learning of their tool and their craft, whether they're going to become a professional dancer or not, just they just fall in love with learning new things. And, and the reason we need many different people on there, so we have many different physiotherapists, not just one, is because we want them to find the person that they resonate with. Now, this is a stage one build as well, and we're just getting started. There are almost a thousand pieces of content on there when you add up all of the podcasts, all of the videos that we have, and all of the articles. You know, we have visions for a sort of stage two and stage three that are going to make it even easier to find stuff, make the whole press process seamless. So we're really excited about not just where it is, but where it can go. And yeah, we just got to get people to get behind it and follow it. And then we can all sort of build it together. It's a very much a, we keep calling it a collaborative project because it really does feel like that. It feels like it's a collaborative project because all of these physios and nutritionists and mind and wellness and the syllabus like Acrobatic Arts and the Royal Academy of Dance, et cetera, and I Adams have all come together and this is what I love about it as well, that we've got organizations, we've got brands, we've got syllabus, we've got individuals all coming together to create something for dance health and dance fitness and dance inspiration. And that's the other thing, part of it that I just really love. I can tell you're really passionate about it. And <laughs> I, I think that really makes a great product. And I know you say you're in the beginning stages, but a thousand pieces of information. That's a lot. So I can't even imagine in a year or two where you'll be. But Joseph, with acrobatic arts being a part of that content lineup, how do you envision dance educators within the acrobatic arts community benefiting from the diverse content on the library aesthetic? Yeah, well, I think obviously um, acrobatic arts already have a wonderful platform and through your membership portals, you already give a lot of sort of training videos and, and such. And so most of the acrobatic arts membership are probably not going to benefit directly from the acrobatic arts content we have on the platform because they probably already have access to that. But what they will benefit from is the physiotherapists, the PTs like Jennifer Milner, um, Sally Harrison, Zach Jones from Heal Yourself and Move, Lisa Howe from the Ballet Blog, from Dr. Nikki Kay, uh, who's a nutritionist, Dr. Stephanie Potrecht, who's a nutritionist. It supports everything that's already been given to them via acrobatic arts. And one of the reasons that we came to acrobatic arts, I just want to sort of, <laughs> this probably feel like a little bit of a plug, but it's not because I'm not an acro dancer. I'm not an acro teacher. I, I was never trained in acro. I don't know that much about it, though I was a break dancer. I started when I was very young, like in my teens, doing break dancing the first time it came to Australia in the 80s. That's as close as I get to acro. But I, And I remember injuring myself constantly. But when I started to learn about um, acrobatic arts, and I did that through Megan Wegg and um, Tim Buckley, who were sort of the Australian division managers at the time and would come out. And then I met um, some of the teachers and examiners over here, Matt Scary from Static Dance Studios, Kate Evans from Beats Per Minute and Jessica from Terpsichore. And I started hearing from them about acrobatic arts and that, and the way they tried to communicate it to me in a way that I could understand was to say that it's very much like uh, something like uh, Vagana or the Royal Academy of Dance, that it has this very structured way of moving the students through that keeps them engaged as well, but it's structured and it's engaged. And that health benefit was really important uh, message they kept sort of pushing to me. And I just, it just, that just really resonated. And so when we were looking to get somebody on the platform to do acro, it was an absolute no brainer to reach out to Mandy 
and say, Mandy, we'd love to have you um, and Acrobatic Arts some content on here because it's exactly the message that we're trying, what you guys are doing is exactly the message. I think another thing that happened to me is, um, I don't know how to pronounce her last name, which is terrible. Um, Briar, Briar Nolet? Yeah, Nolet. Is that Nole, of course. Briar right. Nole. Briar Nole. I just started following her about two years ago on Instagram because I was just like, it just got, it was just one of those things that just popped up on my feed. And I, was, I literally just went, as a contemporary dancer, I just went, wow. I just, she was just so strong and so in control of her technique and what yep. she was doing. And then, and, and was just doing the most phenomenal stuff, but doing it in such a safe, controlled way, but also right on the boundary of, you know, pushing it right to the edge, which is where you want to be as a dancer. You want to push it right to the edge, but know not how to tip over because that's where injuries and fatigue happens. So, and, and she was, she got that, she just gets that balance beautifully. And I, I just got blown away watching her. And so just all of these little pieces of the puzzle sort of came together. Yeah, we we love Briar at Acrobatic Arts and she's done a lot of things for us. It is very impressive when you watch her and you feel safe watching her. And sometimes you can't say that about all the dancers that are out there trying trying things. So, And dancers need to try things. They're always going to push. Um, you know, I always did. We will always want to push. And it's like a parent with a child. A child is always going to push those boundaries. They're going to come up against the boundaries and going to want to push them. And as a parent, you, you're sort of their time. I always say that, you know, I'm my I'm their time guardian. This is what I say to my kids. I'm your sort of time guardian. Like I'm not smarter than you. I've just been here longer. And so there's stuff that I know that happens to your body over time. So and I so I just I have to be, create those boundaries and just push back as their time guardian uh, to say, yes, I know you want to do it. I know why you want to do it. I get that you want to do it. And I want you to do it, but I want you to do it as safely as possible. So you have so that you get to enjoy dance as long as possible. Um, because we all love dance and we want to be able to do it for as long as we can, um, ideally. I agree. Now, I get the library part of the library aesthetic, right, with all the um, information and reading, watching. What is the aesthetic part? Well, aesthetic just, I mean, aesthetic can mean many things, but aesthetic basically means beautiful, doesn't it? So in this context, it should be a beautiful experience um, to actually just visually um, look at the site. We want it to be beautiful. We want it to be feel beautiful in terms of how you connect with it. That is just, I mean, it's it's a kind of a loose thing, but it's beautiful in terms of how you connect with it. We want it to feel beautiful in terms of its support and its care that it gives you. So we're using the word beauty in a very sort of broad, general way when we say aesthetic. And we really want to broaden that idea of what it means to be aesthetic. So it's not just a visual thing. Or, or potentially auditory as well, because you can hear things that are beautiful, you can feel things that are beautiful. Um, but, you know, it's that idea that it's supportive, that it's got a, a sense of community about it. I mean, that's that community part of it is something we really want to build in time, a sense of inclusivity. And that's the other thing that we need to build, continue building in time as well. And that can all be seen as beautiful as well. So it's a beautiful, safe space. And that's really what we wanted to create when we created the library aesthetic. And that's why it got called the library aesthetic. Oh, that's so wonderful. Joseph, you are one of the main people that is behind the content delivery. How do you ensure that the material is not just informative, but also hits that sweet spot for dance educators and studio owners especially those thirsty for knowledge, like those tuned into the Acrobatic Arts podcast? Yeah, it's a really tough question, that one. I'm not, I'm, when you say that I'm behind the content, I don't create content. So just to clarify, um, I'm basically sourcing content and then putting that content onto the platform. Just wanted to clarify that quickly. Um, how do I do it? I guess I go back to probably my first answer. It's the people that I connect with. And those people are people that I've met mostly through iAdams or through Acrobatic Arts or through the Royal Academy of Dance. They're people that I've met along the way because of my relationships that I've built via MDM Dancewear, those physios and podiatrists and nutritionists and strength and conditioning coaches. So we obviously started this process with people that we knew, people that we'd known for many years and sort of trusted and had some idea about their credibility in, in dance. And based on the fact that we've all been in the industry for 30 plus years, 
as well. But it really, that comes down to making these really important connections with organizations like Acrobatic Arts and iAdams to make sure that the, the content is quality and that and what dance teachers and dancers are going to want to have. Now, to some degree, right now, given we only started on December 15th and so we haven't even been open for a month, yes, we've got a thousand pieces of content, but it's a learning curve. It's going to be a learning process about what teachers and dancers really do want. So there will be tweaks, I imagine, as we move forward and we'll find they'll probably end up being a most popular area, I'd say. Um, right now we have a latest releases, but there'll probably be a most popular area that we'll create once we start to see what is popular. And we could even create a most popular for teachers area and a most popular for dancers area. And we could even split that off into different age groups as well, because that will be important. As And so as the site progresses and we start to see what people are watching, what they enjoy, what they want, and we'll get feedback as well, which will be really important. Um, like I said, for me, this is collaborative. You know, none of us have all the answers and we have to ask people and we have to get their feedback. You know, we're basing it right now based on what we think people want, what I guess what we think we'd want <laughs> So, uh, as dancers and teachers. But uh, at the end of the day, um, we're, it's going to be a learning curve. You already mentioned a few of the people that are contributing with the content, but I really encourage everyone to go to the libraryaesthetic.com so that they can see just how many people care about providing their information to this platform. It really is amazing. I can't believe that you just started December 15th or we're live December 15th uh, and, and have that much content. Well, in June 2022, we took a prototype version, of, like a prototype version of the site uh, with just a few pieces of information and some faces and names. We took a prototype version to the iAdams conference in Limerick in Ireland um, for their conference. And we showed it to the board members and to members membership of the um, of iAdams then and said, look, this is what we want to do. Do you think this would be interesting? So we'd been thinking about it and playing with it for months, if not at 12 months before that as well. So this has been a long, it's been a long journey. It's, there's been a lot of time and a lot of money that's sort of gone into sort of building it to this stage. And, you know, like I said, it's a stage one build. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have a million dollars to throw at it. Um, but, you know, we think dance is worth it. We think dance is valuable. Um, we think it should have its own unique platform uh, that services dance like this and dance health. You know, Spotify does that for music and Apple Music does that for music. We want something for dance that's specific to dance, a niche platform for dance. And I think the dance community wants that too. It's like a dance party for everyone. And it sounds like such a wonderful platform. And I can't wait to investigate it a little bit more. But the dance world is so huge. <laughs> and it's been said that the library aesthetic is like the ultimate dance buffet. How do you see the platform enhancing the professional journey of dance educators and studio owners, adding that extra sprinkle of magic to the community, including ours and beyond? Wow. I love that sprinkle. What did you say? Sprinkle of magic? That's such a beautiful line. Sprinkle of magic. Yeah, pixie dust, sprinkle of magic. Um, look, at the end of the day, we all want to be inspired. Uh, you know, there's, there's a line that we say on the library aesthetic, that the most important things, like we, we we actually, if you go into the library aesthetic and you go to the facts area, we say that the library aesthetic is all about building wealth. Now, instantly people are going to go, whoa, what are you talking about? Is it just about getting rich? Is it about building and making money? But then we go on to define what wealth is for us. And right. wealth is really having the time to spend doing what you love doing in good health or in optimal health. And that's really what wealth is. It's being able to spend as much time doing what you love in your passion. And that's what the library aesthetic is ultimately all about. It's about trying to get teachers and students, keep them inspired, but also keep them that little bit healthier. Like we don't call it safe dance practice on the site. We call it safer dance practice because there's no such thing as safe dance practice. Dance is never going to be 100% safe. Because we're always going to push. It's going to be a little bit tired and fatigued sometimes. But it's about us learning 
to be a little safer, each one of us, and then each generation, learning how can I make my studio, how can I make this process just that little bit safer? And so step by step by step, we just keep getting better and better and better and not going the other way. And that's what we want for our kids because at the end of the day, we're all working with kids mostly and children and they're the future. And we don't want them to get into their 20s and 30s and then have be carrying a whole bunch of injuries that they're going to have for the rest of their lives. Better that they've come out of it feeling really strong and secure and really know their body as well and their physicality and their limits and their limitations and whatever they might be and being able to go, yeah, I really got a good sense of who I am. And I would love if the library aesthetic could do that, if it could literally just give people more time doing what they love in their passion. We'll wrap it up with that. That was well said and beautifully put. I can feel the passion behind this project and you know, I want to send out a big congratulations to you and everyone involved. As I said, I think the dance community will love this platform and everyone should go check it out right away. Joseph Brown, thank you so much for joining us on the podcast. Thank you, Lauren. It's been such a pleasure. To close the show, would you happen to have any words of wisdom or inspiration for our listeners? <laughs> oh my goodness, that's a... Uh caught me off guard words of inspiration it's very easy for life to become or seem that everything is sort of quantitative that it's about the numbers the stats um what i love about dance and why I'll never be as popular as mainstream sports and i don't say that as a negative um at all but it's because dance is ultimately qualitative it's subjective it's about you and your personal growth and your personal journey and you can't ever define yourself in opposition or, or to somebody else with that. It really is your journey. And only you know why you're making the choices that you're making and why you're doing the things that you're doing. And so just sit with that, sit deeply with that and enjoy, enjoy that journey. Thank you so much, Joseph Brown, for sharing the exciting details about the library aesthetic. To our listeners, Make sure to check out the platform and immerse yourselves in the world of dance like never before. Until next time, stay strong, stay flexible, and stay tuned for more captivating episodes of the Acrobatic Arts Podcast. Thanks for listening, everyone, and have a great day.